Thank you for attending the Forge Base Sheet Production Systems done by Dr. Stewart, and he's with the University of Wyoming, and we're very fortunate to have him. He escaped out of Montana and come live in Wyoming. <laughs> and so we're going to learn all sorts of great things um, about sheep and forage base. So go ahead. All right, thank you, Kathy. We appreciate it. I don't know if you're lucky or not to have me because. Uh, well, I, every every place I've been I've, has been for our school thus far. So they're two, three, and two, three year stints, right? So either I'm good or I've driven off in about three years. So I'm coming on that uh, being pushed out phase of, of my program. I, I'm always excited to talk about sheep in the industry. I think we've got a great story to tell. We work with a outstanding species that's versatile for resources, and it's just good for um, civilization and society. So today, I hope you'll. You'll uh, bear with me as we talk about some things that uh, are near and dear to me. I think as I travel throughout the country and giving these sheep talks, I always keep the disclaimer that I am not the expert. You're the expert because it's the combination of the art of production that you guys do and the melding of those scientific principles that you probably do instinctively. And so uh, as I thought about what I was going to talk about today, I think some of the common things that have come up throughout my time in Wyoming, whether large operators or small operators, there's things that we overlook. And um, I think that there's a good opportunity to be reminded of some of these things, especially because they're not just academic uh, ramblings, but there's truly some, some revenue to be made as we, as we maximize some of these things. So I'm going to talk about body condition scoring and nutritional management of sheep. I alluded to that last year at last year's conference, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Uh, we have a new gentleman here who's looking to get into the business, and uh, we're going to talk about breed considerations and, and determining harvest weight across different breeds. Uh, we'll discuss crossbreeding and heterosis and why crossbreeding is not a four letter word. <laughs> if you're buying purebred sheep, I'm sure the person you're buying from will say it's, it's a four letter word, but heterosis is, is the quickest trip to a free lunch that we have. And then I'm going to give some updates on what dewormers are still working in our region. There's tremendous uh, anthelmintic resistance going on internationally, uh, and we, we're concluding some studies that are telling us what dewormers still work in our area. Uh, how many of us currently have sheep? Can I get by a show of hands? One, two. All right. The rest of us are thinking about it, maybe? Oh, I would love to, but I think my landlady would not be about Okay. All right. <laughs> Well, these are considerations maybe down the line, yes, right? Yes. Okay, good. Well, I, I throw out some of these uh, some of these certification standards for organic production, and since there's not a ton of us currently on that track, am I wrong in that assumption? Are we certified organic, the two of us? That, I, no? I used to be. Okay. Used to be. All right. It's just real hard to find a certified organic processor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's impossible. Essentially, yeah, and for in our logistically in our area. So I'm going to skip this over a little bit, and that that kind of gives us a little bit more common ground. Can everybody see this all right, or should we dim the the lights a little bit more? Focus just a little. I wonder if we can. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. All right. So why do I focus so much on feed? Well, one, I'm a nutritionist by training. That was all my graduate work. Uh, but I think this matters significantly to us because it represents the majority of our inputs. Labor, of course, is a major one. But how much it costs to feed our sheep and having a strategy to plan to do so on an annual calendar is, is probably the most expensive and or variable cost that we experience. This, this data comes out of uh, the Livestock Marketing Information Center. Some good work done here at the University of Wyoming. And this broke it up into regions, and, and based off of the region that we were in, we had the luxury of naming the Intermount region Wyoming, the Southern Plains, Texas area, Texas, the Northern Plains, North Dakota, the Mid-Atlantic, Kentucky. Okay, so those are some pretty broad regions, but we surveyed producers throughout the US and got some of this information to determine what were the majority of their input costs. And luckily, in our region, uh, our, our annual variable costs, especially because we can utilize some public and private ground uh, cheaply, our, our costs are less than other parts of the country. But depending on the quantity of, of feedstuffs that you harvest, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to vary. But the point is, is it takes a tremendous amount of our resources. Something that, that goes back to body condition scoring and why it's important is that should be an initial step in how we reevaluate 
our feed production systems each year. Uh, tell me your name again, sir. I'm Lou. Lou? Will. 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 Okay, I should remember that. I'm with your Will. Uh, Will was telling me there's a lot of opportunity to pick up grazing ground and, and have some uh, low input in terms of what you have to pay for some of those feeds in his area. Is that correct, Will? There's some opportunity there. Well, when we think about how we're going to go about that, we need to consider where we're starting at. I'm going to show you a little bit. Body condition scoring, and you probably do it visually. It's harder to do when the animal has three inches of fleece on it. But it's critically important, and it's uniquely important to sheep because we can manipulate nutrition to increase the productivity. All right? In cattle and other livestock species, the response is not as great as it is in, in, in sheep. So I mentioned it's difficult to do without hands. You can see here based off this image, once you, uh, once you shear that animal and you start to palpate that uh, transverse process, this, this back rib, short rib region of the sheep, uh, you can get a better idea. But once you pull the, pull the wool off, it's almost too late to care about body conditions for it. And I say that because as we get into late gestation, those nutritional requirements go up significantly. As we move into lactation, we're almost too far behind to be able to manipulate the nutrition to meet the stage of production. And so it takes some hands-on exercise. And I just want to refresh our memories about how it's done. You know, obviously it needs to be done in a race, but the purpose of what we're doing is we're palpating that spinous process, uh, that short rib region, and we're palpating the transverse process. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to feel how pronounced it is and the feel in, in between those vertebrae. A body condition score of one on a scale of five is the lowest body condition score. And I would say that if you have many sheep in this body condition score, they're not going to be with us much longer. It's important that we identify those before they get to a body condition score of one. But if you feel that spinous process region, it's going to be very pronounced. It's going to be sharp. And even with a lot of wool on them, you're probably going to be able to see it. But as we move towards closer to an average, um, Again, we start to see more noticeable fill as we put pressure and feel that short rib region. It almost feels like the back of your fingers, okay? The space, as you rub your fingers across that, it feels like the back uh, of your fingers in terms of what that vertebrae are doing. And so as it begins to fill in more fat and more muscle, um, it increases in body condition score. A body condition score of two uh, is not too uncommon, especially when they're 30, 35, 40 days of milk. And you know better than anyone. They really pull it off of them as they ramp up their lactation. But this is probably a threshold that we don't want to go below. We can expect them to lose condition when they're raising lambs. But a body condition score of two is important to remember, especially when we work sheep in the chute and feel the spinous and transverse process. Okay? Moving up to a body condition score of three, if you're like me, you like simple, uh, consistent ways of gauging body condition score, it feels like running your your thumb over that last part of your fingers, okay? Other people use the top of their, their knuckles to get a feel for what it actually feels like. Okay, as we get to a body condition score of three, we're approaching perhaps the ideal. We get much more than this. Sometimes we have issues with conception. Uh, as we move into a body condition score of four, where you can see there's a tremendous amount of fat cover there. The, both uh, the lean mass is at its maximum as well. A body condition score of four, shouldn't occur a whole lot in our operation. However, as I've worked with small flock operators throughout the state, I, I think that overnourished sheep is probably more common than our undernourished sheep. The opposite is true probably in our range flocks based on some of the range resources. But the point is, is as we get to a body condition score of four, we start losing production in these years, and they're not significantly or consistently productive when they maintain that level of fat. Of course, a body condition score of five, probably closer to where I'm at these days. Um, it's excessive, it doesn't need to be uh, that much cover. And again, that animal is gonna have problems breeding up. It's probably gonna have some dystocia issues when it comes to lambing, and it's just not a very good place to be. <laughs> I mentioned the scale that I like to use again. I think it's worth remembering this scale because if you purchase sheep, or as you work sheep prior to breeding, and I'm gonna show you some data in a minute, you wanna make sure that you know where your flock sits in the average. <clears throat> Okay? And not every year is going to be the same. I think this winter, I've spent more time out in the Red Desert looking at some of the condition of the ewes as they've had a significant amount of snowfall. Um, the available forage on the winter range has been 
limited significantly. And those views are probably closer to it too. I'm getting nervous to hear some of the stories of planning. Uh, it's something that if you can gauge every once in a while and get your hands on the U, you can adapt how you feed those U's, and we'll talk about that. I like simplicity. There's beauty in simplicity. I oftentimes, when we work at the sheep at the university, again, I'll never say that we run sheep exactly how a commercial operation should be run, but we work them occasionally, especially at lambing and at weaning, and we get this histogram we generate for each sheep where they lie on that scale of a one to five, we put an X for each sheep. And after we do about 25 at random throughout our flock, we have an idea of where we sit on an average. So based off of this, this simplistic example here, the average sits at about a three. I think keeping those records and doing it is a good exercise for your management. If more ewes are coming in at three and a half, four, you know that perhaps flushing, increasing their plant of nutrition prior to breeding probably isn't gonna be warranted. In contrast, if you come in a body condition score at two, two and a half, and that's your average in your flock, you know that a large majority of your flock is gonna be receptive to the flushing treatment and you'll increase their ovulation rates and get more. So it's a fluid type of management program, but it requires that we get our hands on the sheep. I always like telling stories about why things matter. I think, yes. Um, I was just curious, you said you did 25 of so we have about 250 commercial ewes at Randa. Mm -hmm. So we're hitting about 10%. And that's a good rule of thumb. That's a good question. If you hit about 10%, but if you're a small flock, it probably is warranted to do everything. Um, we kind of work with uh, students, and so we have good resources with um, uh, labor, and we don't have as much challenges with labor that you folks probably do. So we oftentimes will body conditions for everything off to help teach it as well. But 10% is a good place to be. Uh, body condition score at breeding is before you turn out rams can be a very profitable uh, activity for you. Um, this data comes from Oregon State University on, on more polypay type sheep, so very prolific type sheep breeds, uh, many twins, triplets. And they found with this, that type of view, as they increased the body condition score at two and a half to three, they saw almost a 30 pound increase in total pounds of lamb wheat. Okay. Um, and, and this has been replicated internationally. We know that if we feed our ewes better and they're in better condition at breeding, they're going to raise more pounds of lamb. Now, what's interesting, what this data should show you is you get above average at three and a half, pushing that more fat scale of our body condition scores, you're not seeing the dramatic increase as you would at an average body condition score and going slightly above average. And so it'd be nice to see if they body condition scored some really obese ewes and looked at their decreased productivity, but they, they didn't in this data set. The point is, is it pays to pay attention to this at breeding. A larger multi-farm uh, data set out of Australia shows that uh, survival of those newborn lambs is significantly influenced by the body condition score at lambing. So in Western Australia, uh, they had four locations. Um, those that had used a body condition score of 2.2 or about average, I had about a 74% survival rate of the singles and a 38 survival rate of the twins. Again, a pasture lambing, no shed based management. But what you can see here is they moved to a 3.1. They significantly increased the survival of both single and twins. The same stories there when they went across the country. The point is, is this pays to do it. It pays to do it yearly, uh, three or four times a year as your labor permits. All right, so let's talk about meeting nutritional requirements. Are we falling asleep with the lights on? I worry about that. No, I won't fall asleep because I'm uh, I'm up here, but I, I might. So let's open that up for a little Chris. There we go. All right, that's perfect. I, I'm teaching sheep production right now, and I have 30 kids, and it's at 10, and I do that strategically so they don't fall asleep. But still, every once in a while I start seeing them. Not, I know it's not because they agree with what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I, just as body condition score is a very fluid, uh, changing dynamic in our flock, so is our approach to meeting those nutritional requirements. When we look at the different time points and how we manage the nutrition of those time points, I want us to be thinking about ways that we can do it most cost effectively. And I think we all can agree that the most cost effective way to feed sheep is to not buy it and haul it to them. Are we in agreement on that? Letting the sheep during the harvest be good. All right, so we'll have some good discussion then. But at these time points, oftentimes our resource in the forage is not adequate. <coughs> and so 
Um, I'm going to give some tips as to how we can deal with that at the various stages of production. Now, when you look at this, I'm going to assume this is based off of 154 pound U, but I have the various stages in this first column here. And you can see that when that U is dry, let's just say most of us are winning sometime in August or so, we've got some time before we breed that U back that we can really give her the lower quality feed ingredients so that we're not expending uh, those precious energy and protein resources when she doesn't need them, okay? Um, about 1.5 pounds of total digestible nutrients or half a pound of crude protein. But you can see as we move up from flushing and we try to raise that plant of nutrition to get more ovulation in that U, um, you can see that you have to increase that energy and also increase the crude protein. The point with this is that it's not, it's not the same throughout the year. And if we have feed budgeting resources where if we are going to purchase feed, we should prioritize that higher dollar feed, that more nutritious feed source uh, for the later periods of gestation and lactation. As you can see that that you, even in late lactation and early lactation, no matter what we feed her, she cannot eat enough to, to stay in a positive energy balance. Perhaps some of us like to visualize it this way, and I think this, this tells the story a little bit better. In our flocks, in my experience over the years, is that um, you know, maintenance is something where we oftentimes can kick those ewes out on some rough pasture and they can take care of themselves until we get ready to start breeding. But as we look towards flushing, are we all clear what flushing is? Maybe we'll just talk about that briefly. Flushing refers to feeding a grain or an increased energy source or better feed the two weeks prior to turning out rams. And what we're doing is we're tricking that ewe physiologically into thinking that she has the nutrition to support greater reproductive efficiency. So she starts to ovulate more as a result of that greater energy that she's getting, which results to us in 15 to 30 percent more lambs born. All right. And what's important for that is that we understand that if our ewes are average or below average, that's the only time flushing is going to give us more lambs. If our ewes are coming into breeding and they're they're a little on the heavy side in terms of body condition score, don't flush them because you don't see any increase in ovulation rate. So flushing is important. Remember that it only works on those ewes that are average to below average in condition. What I really want to show with this is those last six weeks of gestation is the time period where that fetus is growing at the most rapid rate. And it's, it's sinking a lot of nutrients in the growth of those fetuses at that point. As we get into early lactation, um, depending on the breed, that's going to be 25 oh, to 35 days. Uh, that's when they're at the peak lactation. You see that there's quite a difference in what is required in terms of uh, those TDM, those digestible nutrients, uh, as you get into early lactation. Also, remember, I don't know what our drop rates are. Let's go around the room and talk about how many lambs, what's our lambing percentage? Not our weaning percentage, but our lambing percentage. Catherine, where are you at? I am at 175%. 175%, okay. You're going to be there. 185? Okay. What breeds are those, Bill? East Parisian and Lacombe. Okay. Well, how long do you like to Well, early like lactation. So we're assuming with this that early lactation is the first 25 days. Late lactation is uh, 25 to 75 days. What's your lactation curve look like? That's a good the question. They'll peak at. 30, 45 to 60 days, uh, they'll peak out. I also don't peak at 30. A good you, Dr. You shouldn't go for 200 days. Really? Yeah. Wow. And the real good ones are still not <laughs> <good. laughs> so you make it, Wow. And some will go out to 300. The the peak milking, I don't think we're exceeding what a Suffolk will do in the first 30 days. Really? But the Suffolk won't last. No. Won't last. And that's, that's the, biggest, the biggest difference. That's absolutely right. So for yours, you're, you're clearly manipulating that nutrition to get maximum lactation throughout a very long period. Is that correct, Bill? After all these years, I'm not sure that we've managed it. That's one of the things we never did conquer, and that was to keep the fat off and, and keep them melting. Uh, the, the body, keep the body score down. Our body score has always got, would get too high on us, and I think that was hurting how long Jimmy were used. Wow. Uh, now we were bunk line feed. Okay. So a TMR type of Yeah, TMR yeah. mixturation compared to the people east and east of Mississippi and stuff. I mean, they were like crazy. And I was, I, I told them at the meetings that 
I didn't have any cheap things. Everything was an expensive fee that he was making. That's right. That is not a tractor. Had a feel for grazing right. out. But, but here again, that was the way we managed it. Well, that's interesting. That's a really good point. I think being aware, did, does anyone else run cheap? I know that not everyone raised their hand. No? Okay. All right. So, so being aware of, of the growth of those lands, especially in a smaller flock scenario, we can kind of see when those ewes start to drop off in their lactation. Bill had a good point. Our Suffolk ewes that we have on campus, we probably really start to diminish any kind of significant milk production at 65 to 90 days. We start seeing ewes dry off that early, okay? And, and I think a lot of that is probably due to the physical trauma of the bigger lambs hitting that bag. I don't know what it is, but they dry off quickly. So being observant is really important when you're trying to manage that nutrition. Um, looking at crude protein, there's an even greater difference. Um, when we get a single born lamb, you can see versus a twin bearing ewe, I'm sorry, a, a single bearing uh, ewe versus a twin bearing ewe, there's really not a whole lot of difference in the crude protein required until we get into the last six weeks into lactation. And so I don't know if many of us ultrasound and count those fetuses or not, but it, it behooves us to pay attention to those who might be carrying multiples, whether we split those off and manage them separately or not. But I think even Catherine, if you said you're at 180, 175, uh, there may be genetics in your flock that you know every year are going to give you a twin. I think knowing those that uh, are consistently multiple birth uh, used can help you manage those separately if you have the resources. Probably not. I okay. Know. Well, then my recommendation is to feed everything as if they carry a twin. That's sometimes how we design studies. You know, unique, I, I always get in this argument with beef cattle people because, uh, you know, when you look at the amount of the weight of the fetuses that we carry in a pregnant ewe compared to the weight of the fetus in a cow, uh, we have significantly more restricted room and space as a result of those growing fetuses in sheep. And what results in late, late gestation especially is that they don't have the capacity to eat enough to meet their requirements in many cases. And so we do things like mechanically reduce the particle size so that we don't uh, have as, so we can reduce the bulk or increase the bulk density in the rumen so that we can feed those ewes enough. But, but what the, I argue with the beef cattle guys is for us in the sheep industry, when we get um, to that last 40 days of gestation, uh, some supplemental energy in the form of corn or a small grain that has a high caloric density that doesn't take up a lot of space in the rumen is a really, really good thing to have on hand. And I know some, some folks are diametrically opposed to feeding any kind of high starch or high grain diet, but those philosophical disagreements aside, in sheep, we've got to make sure that one, we're feeding a highly digestible, nutritious forage when we reduce the particle size, but even better if we can supplement with some grain at that point to meet the glucose demands of that growing fetus should be a strategy that we prioritize. I already mentioned that that last uh, 45 days of pregnancy is when that, those, fe those fetuses are growing at the most rapid rate and they're, they're restricting that rumen capacity significantly at that stage of production. So that's something that I see people, uh, well, it's important to remember that supplementing in late gestation is pretty important in sheep, especially multiple sheep. Uh, I throw this up here, and again, you have those in your notes. I don't need to go through those in great detail, other than to show you that, you know, oftentimes our, our cool season grasses here, our crested wheat grasses, our western, western wheat grasses, if that is our only strategy to feeding our ewes, oftentimes they're inadequate uh, for those critical stages of production. Both of these scenarios, I give one, the top uh, table there talks about late pregnancy, and I give three different forage varieties, native grass hay, uh, good quality meadow hay, and grass alfalfa. I know that those aren't species, but they, I took the nutritional value based off of what we run in this area. You can see that if that is our only strategy, we're gonna be falling short in terms of energy um, as, we, as we go on in the cycle. So look at that, I think that's, that's helpful as you kind of evaluate things. Yes, Catherine. Um, I feed alfalfa. And it's a running battle with my husband about when to cut. Okay. <laughs> I, I grew up with those battles, so right. I know what you're talking about, yeah. And so I end up with a protein level in, in the low 20s. Wow. Yeah. And so far, I haven't had any problems with shooting on there. Well, you know, 20% is, is at the level 
where any excess protein, I think we get below or above 16%, the sheep don't have the ability to absorb that increased protein. And so a lot of it's going to be excreted, which is not a bad thing. But I think you, you raise a really good scenario, Catherine. There's a lot of people, we probably, because we have the feed resources, we probably are overfeeding at certain times the production year, especially when it's a 20% alfalfa. Yeah. And it's hard to uh, it's hard to reduce that because I'm sure, how do you feed them? Is it in a small square or, or round bale? Or? Big round bale. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like you can blend it like Bill could with the lower quality uh, grass hay. Yeah. I will, I will mention something to think about is you shed lamb, I assume? Um, I have a lambing barn. Okay. Well, something that if you had to prioritize not feeding so much protein, it's probably that 48 hours that they're in the lambing barn. Because something to keep in mind is when they excrete that, uh, that protein in their urine, it turns to ammonia at the ground level and it creates respiratory issues. But uh, again, it's hard to have that kind of precision management at certain times of the year. We just don't have six, seven ingredients, right? I mean, right, and it's a battle just to get, just to let, just for my husband to allow the alfalfa to go to 10% or 15% bloom. He just wants it, he wants it cut early. <laughs> yeah, good. All right. Well, uh, one thing I see also is we often don't think about our rams as much as we should. Um, even though rams have a pretty cush life, I think anyone could argue that their lifestyle is pretty, pretty, nice. pretty, pretty easy, right? Uh, but, but in our country in Wyoming, especially in our large range flocks, uh, not so much for the small flock producer, but uh, if we are trying to gain weight back on those rams after a very intensive breeding season, because they always lose weight, there's no question about it. If we're trying to do it with only the ingredients that we can grow on our ranch, and in this example being low quality grass hay, we're just not gonna do it, especially when it comes to protein. It's hard to read some of the font there, but that's a crested wheatgrass. This is again, a meadow hay, kind of a brome type grass, 11.2% crude protein. And then alfalfa here is the gray bar. But you can see in those very mature, cool season grasses, it's going to be impossible to meet those requirements of that ram after breeding. Uh, and, and I know we don't always think about that, but in our black faced rams and our larger flocks throughout the state, how many, how many years of breeding do you think they're getting on average? One and a half. One and a half years. Okay. And, and we oftentimes criticize, oh, we just got to raise better black faced sheep. Well, if we could raise sheep to have elite metabolism and, and not have to feed them, uh, then I could quit my job. But the reality is, is many of these cases, the longevity issues we're seeing are a result of nutrition and such. In many cases, especially for our range operators. The point this was the gentleman from the lowlands of England, and they run sheep, and they would have they had black face sheep, and then they had the black face Scottish. Okay. But there's some sheep. Didn't live as long as the mountain sheep did over there. Suffolk's are a short lived life span of you. Yeah. Buck. Yeah. They're just genetically are short lived. And, and they have different physiological requirements. Think about the muscle mass they carry. They turn over that protein in their body more rapidly, more quickly than a lesser muscled maternal breed, right? right. And so that's just that's us being aware that, that that type of sheep needs increased nutrition. And so we're doing some experiments throughout the state this year to see if increasing that plant and nutrition post-breeding is gonna increase the longevity of those black face rams. Uh, I show this scenario again, I think it's not uncommon for our rams to come off an average body condition score, which is a two and a half. And I put some of these scenarios together because believe it or not, as we move into uh, the great state of Wyoming, there just aren't the feed resources that we have as we go east, and we know this, of course. But I, I give some examples here, that meadow hay scenario, and this is, how many days would it take to increase half of a body condition score if we just fed that ram six pounds of meadow hay a day? And you can see that it would take 81 days to get it back to slightly above average. Meadow hay with a pound of corn, it'd be about 46 days. Alfalfa, even with all that protein, it would take 90 days. And so what I try to, try to point out here is having some grain storage ability on your ranch, even if you are far removed, it does not take a lot of energy in sheep production systems to get a ton of bang for your buck. Flushing is one. This is another example. And we don't need to spend tons of inputs on these grains, but we can spend a little bit and get a lot of return in terms of what we're doing for those animals. 
since none of us are organic here, I just I I point this out because every last year when I came to this conference, I was just prepared to be bombarded with organic regulation type, type questions, right? And I, I work in a more of a, a conventional system. I have nothing against organic production, but my recommendations <coughs> in the organic system, you can see certified organic grain, this is based off of 2018 prices. There's a significant difference, and that's a challenge. Uh, so um, I just show that, I guess, to, to show that there is a difference when trying to source those grains for a supplementation protocol. I don't necessarily think it's feasible, Catherine. I don't know. Do you think so? With this, these price differences? Yeah, it's it's tough to do. Uh, we talked about peak lactation, something that I've, I've I've really thought was interesting. And I think producers in the up in um, Lakes area near Gillette, uh, Douglas, a lot of those producers have pushed off lambing into late May, early June. Okay, and I always thought, wow, why why is that? Obviously, the weather's more favorable, our lamb losses would be less. But I think it's interesting from a physiological and nutritional standpoint, is as those new, those producers looking at the forage decline and crude protein values, they're kind of maximizing when those use in peak lactation out on pasture. You know, 28 to 35 days for most of our Rambouillet Western white face ewes, uh, they're lambing uh, at a time when those ewes don't need to be fed um, with a ton of additional energy supplements or protein supplements, just based off the quality of their native range. Well, I, go ahead. Uh, one point on the on the lamb, the amount of milk you're going to get. Mm -hmm. If the ewe milks on lambs on Christmas Day, you'll get more milk out of her than you will if she lambs on any other day of the year. Because as they cycle, when daylights get shorter, they melt more if daylight gets longer. That's right. When you hit September, most of even the kid, a lot of good you didn't check out on you. Do they? they milk in September. Do you notice a difference also with how they know whether they were whether they had birth to a single or a twin? Do you see increased milk production in the twin bearing ewes? We really I don't know we really didn't identify that. Okay. Yes, I, I the research I know does indicate that the twin bearing will have more milk as a group. The big the big there's really said that every of them said okay this is what they're talking about. So from a dairy perspective, you're probably timing that so you can maximize well, that production. No, it's management, weather, market, all that good stuff. The problem is everybody in the industry has the same problem getting the bread. If, if we get a lamb, we go from 600 dues, if we get a lamb to 100 a month for 12 months, that had been fantastic. But we couldn't. We, yeah. we never did perfect it. That was cedars and some different breeding. To that extent, can there are some guys are doing better? I see. I guess we got time to do. The one I want is the out of season breeding program, where they've been done Cornell five times. They're all the accelerated lambing. Yeah, all I think. My belief is that you'll get a couple of good years, and then you'll breed a hundred ewes in the spring, and you'll get one lamb, or in my case, I have one ewe come to milk. No lamb, but you feed the milk in the fall. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that those ewes are 40, that they bred, but we've had a ma we had a major abortion, and in all these different over but watching this for 30 years and doing some myself, people would get a couple out of season lambing programs work really good, get to the good fall lambs, and then all of a sudden they'll have a break and they'll have a real force <laughs> hard to get anything done. I'm saying them bucks will work and the ewes are cycling. Like always, but they're important in the in the middle of that early, early because you never see them. They're reabsorbing. Yeah, they're not important. Mm -hmm. They're reabsorbing. Yep. those lambs. And I just I bring that up is because it's out of season breeding and lamb. In well, fact, you talk about May and June, the greatest time on a farm block is lamb in September, October. Yeah, great. But we've got time. We've got lots of people. <laughs> That's true. So pushing yeah. lambing back, but, but you can't you can't get them cycle. Yeah. And you know, there's the breed differences, obviously. We have some more uh, aseasonal breeds that can do that. But I agree with you, I think. And I think a lot of that goes back to some of the nutrition in those accelerated programs. What Bill's referring to is there's certain flocks in the Midwest and New York that get three lamb crops in two years. So they wean pretty rapidly and they re-expose those ewes in those off seasons to breed. And um, I, I think a lot of that does go back to nutrition. Maybe OPP is another one as well. Ovine progressive pneumonia has an effect on some of those, I believe. But 
what's interesting, Bill, and you mentioned that is it all does go back to how how good of attention we're, we're paying in that early embryonic development. Because the majority of our losses in the pregnant view is going to be in those first 45 days. She has to communicate, the fetus has to communicate to the brain of the dam that, hey, I'm here, don't restart your cycle and get rid of me. And that's really hard to do when we're pushing them that hard, I feel like, to some degree. But also, the same thing could happen. Then. What I think it is is that this, genetically, she don't want, she's not physiologically ready to spring and breed. Some years it works, but there's but what you're saying, something's some triggered her to kick him out or to quit. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Even in our with our best manipulation, you know, it's hard to get them out of season. And I agree with you. I think it, it, I'm actually on a grad committee now. But we're trying to do that better. Yes. So I know horses a little better. So are you saying that sheep have need to have maternal recognition of pregnancy so that that fetal um, body is then somehow? Sending a hormonal response to, to the use is like a, a chemical use to the Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And right. ours usually happens around 60 days in the horse. Where is Well, ours is going to be anywhere from, well, day 16 to 45. Okay. okay. But generically speaking, that first 45 days. And so our recommendation is if, even if our nutrition is great, if we forget that that is a critical time for recognizing that fetus and we work the sheep a lot. Or, or disrupt them or stress them out, we have a greater percentage of reabsorption okay. early on okay. as a result of that. Yeah, good discussion. I'm glad we're talking about this. Uh, the point is, is depending on your resources, you're going to buy some door burner use, and you're going to determine your first lambing season with surety what you want to do different next year. I mean, that's for sure. We all do that in the sheep business, and I think it's important, those of us that are thinking about getting sheep, is that we are very... Uh, we're thinking about how we would do things different. But as I look at what's happening as a trend in our larger range flocks in, in Blake's part of this, the country in Eastern uh, Wyoming, I think we're seeing some of this shift into the later months, not only for weather, but because they're still able to get the maximum amount of their forages before they decline. All right, let's talk about breeds for a sec, all right? I don't know what it is about talking about purebred sheep breeds, but it's almost as bad about talk as talking about politics. I swear, I, in some of the larger venues where I speak and we discuss breeds, some of my harshest critics are <laughs> purebred breeders. They say, how dare you? We, we've been doing studies evaluating the South African meat breed. There's a really good breeder in South Dakota, and some of our data showed that they weren't better than the traditional Rambouillet in certain areas, right? And, oh, man, I got a chewing bit. I will never forget, okay? And I said, the statistics and the science said it, not me. I wasn't playing favorites. But anyway, I want to talk about breeds for a sec because something that we overlook is, is why we choose the breed we do. And it's pretentious for me to say that you're, you've chose the breeds you are using now because I know. I don't know, but I think it should be based off of uh, some of our, 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 our individual circumstances. And these are some things that people forget to overlook. The first, the most simplistic is purebred versus commercial. Uh, Will, you might have that option. You may determine that you might want to do purebred sheep as well to supplement your income. If not, then why do we just stick with one breed when we can maximize heterosis? Are you what breeds yeah, are you looking at? The Dorper and the Kennedy. The Katana? Okay. Yeah. All right. So two good hair sheep breeds. All right. The other thing is marketing objectives. And I think we all know this, but how do we market our feeder lambs? Bill, you're a dairy sheep person, and so. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this, but but are we marketing feeder lambs like the majority of ranchers in, in Wyoming? Okay, very very few operations are fattening the majority of their lamb crop for, for slaughter uh, lamb production, okay? So for marketing feeder lambs, maybe we want to choose a breed that is going to maximize growth up until weaning, okay? Same thing, are we selling finished lambs? Is it a farmer's market, niche market? Back where I'm from in Western New York, that was all of our our clientele, the ethnic markets, and niche marketing. But what we understood early on is that if we were selling finished lambs and the carcasses and the meat to directly to the consumer, we had to be raising breeds of sheep that were very consistent. We couldn't be changing our mind. Uh, making sure that you have some breed versatility for multiple markets. Maybe some of us market only a majority of our lambs as freezer lambs, and the rest go to the auction. Is the breed you're using versatile enough to do both? Um, there's there's hand spinning fleeces now. Catherine, don't you do some hand spinning stuff? Mm -hmm. I do. 
And it was one of the reasons why I got the Columbians, was to, to have that role. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so you market some of those directly, and your probably return on a per fleece value is much higher than what we're selling in the commodity market. Is that correct? Absolutely. And if I have it processed, then I'm selling it by the house. Okay. It, absolutely. So the point is, is I, I just, those of us that are thinking about raising sheep, we should ask ourselves these questions. And it should not be the neighbor's input. Sometimes the neighbor can tell us a lot about how to raise sheep very effectively. But when it comes to advice about breeds and maximizing heterosis and productivity by crossing breeds, sometimes you don't want to ask that advice to the person selling you bucks or use. Lifestyle labor, and I know that this is probably for some people not as important, but many of the, the questions I get as extension sheep specialists are for lifestyle growers that have 20, 30 head of sheep. And they chose that breed of sheep because it fit their lifestyle, their part-time lifestyle of raising sheep, okay? Shearing for some people, I did my PhD work in Texas, for some reason, they just, they, they just determined that wool was a burden and they didn't want to mess with it, even on large flocks. And so they made up in their mind that hair sheep were gonna eliminate that lifestyle challenge that they faced, okay? Right, wrong, or different, these are kind of some of the criteria that people go through. Uh, you know, I, I'm not gonna talk about conventional versus direct marketing, too much here other than to say that they're two different segments and, and especially for you will if you're going to get into the hair sheep i think realizing early on that there is going to be some price reduction uh trying to sell your hair sheep in a conventional market system but you can sell those same hair sheep down in centennial to an ethnic buyer that's going to pay you a premium well, so we'll be doing everything correct margin because that's what we're doing with the rest of our funds okay already, so Okay, so you've already had that system in place, you know. So here's a good talking point then when it comes to that. We experimented with hair sheep a little back in Western New York because the wool for us, we couldn't do a good job growing it and couldn't get a premium for it. So we experimented with hair sheep. One of our challenges with raising hair sheep, a smaller frame breed of sheep, is that the carcass weight was, was not enough for us as a direct marketer under our circumstances. But if you have a forage system and you can finish those lambs at 100 pounds, and you have a good processor, then a 50 pound carcass isn't a big deal. But for us, we needed to have a 70 plus size carcass for our cutout to work uh, from a processing standpoint. But these are some of the differences that exist. And I just, I encourage you to pay attention to some of these as you go back and think about some of the nonsense that I spoke here today, uh, as you kind of reevaluate or think about how you're gonna do things differently. Any comments on this before I move on? I know I've got 10 minutes, so. Bill. Very quick on, on the dairy breeds. There's a lot of there's uh, four breeds. East breeds is the most common, come out of Holland, big, tall, heavy milk and use, susceptible to pneumonia, uh, least strong of all of them. Lacombe from France had the greatest data research on them. They don't have to grow enough hair to take care of themselves in Wyoming. Yeah. Nice milk and sheep, but they don't know what to give Good sheep. But then there's the Ossoff that's coming out of Spain, and they're a fat tail cross. With the freezing, probably the toughest of them all. The one that I think in Wyoming have always thought is the British milk sheep. They're a freezing derivative, but their lambs are taught to be this much taller at birth and they'll have more wool than any other, probably even than a, maybe a Columbia. Really? It's the only lamb that has as much wool when they're born. Get to the feet, the big, tall, the bigger, whole milk by as good as freezing. The problem is that genetically in England, the Hoof and mouth disease down there annihilated it. There are some up in Canada. But they really, if somebody's going to, I know I've heard about milk cross the trees in order to bring juice, to bring more milk. I, and I really would go back in with the British milk sheep, but I like it out of Canada. Because they, they're nice. I like them. I like them. It's great dairy, but probably. Do you have some, though? We had a few. We brought some semen in. We, I don't know that we've got anything left yet. We haven't used any more bucks over the years. Okay. Yeah. But that's a good point you, you raise. I think yeah. under your management system, you need very healthy, vigorous lambs at birth. I don't know anybody who doesn't need those. Yeah, I mean, it just, right? yeah. yeah. The uh, one of the quick, quick, quick on feed lambs, basically for 13 years, no lamb lived, grew up on the spot. Everything was bottom fit. So we was running 1,200 years, of, well, more than 1,200 lambs a year on models. Wow. And, and so we were weaning them uh, full, full feed milk. Actually, Jersey cow milk, but we wait them 30 days, 28 to 30 days. 
The other side, if you if you're in an environment, get the creek down thirty days, they go on diet. They got to go on cook. Got to be eating creek. Yeah, and they got to be fed well. Yeah, but that is, you know, this whole thing. Leave them out if you can, but if there's time predators or anything else, I'm you put off the wind at thirty days and say, keep me out, keep the out of it. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Bill. Yeah. That's that's a really good point. Going back to you thinking about the breeds that we use, having criteria that we've established, you clearly have a system that you're evaluating those genetics pretty readily. Uh, you know, many of us who do market freezer lamb, this is a really, this is a money slide for you because when you think about when your lambs are gonna be ready to market, there's a very good formula that we utilize. It <laughs> takes the mature dam weight and the mature sire weight, and I'll show you an example here. It's essentially, you take the sire breed mature weight, you breed the mature weight, divide it by two, and multiply that by 0.65, and that tells you what the ideal slaughter weight is gonna be, okay? If there's a problem in the commercial lamb industry right now, it's our inability to kill lambs on time and maximize a good product, okay? Because we produce all our lambs, in the, they, they're weaned in the fall, we have a glut of lambs available from fall to early spring. We get into the summer months and we don't have a very good consistent supply. And so if we try and feed a lamb over that target slaughter weight, we just increase that fat cover and we reduce the quality of product that we offer in the industry. And so right now, so what's that? We feed a lot of dogs. Yeah, so well, you, and that, it just breaks you know your heart. No, no, and it breaks your heart. So that's why I, I encourage you to use this formula. Uh, I wish we could get some of our larger feedlots to utilize this formula. Because where I came from in Montana, there was a lot of moderate framed wool use, 150 pounds. When I got to Wyoming, uh, we're closer to 180, 200 pound use in some of these flocks. But you can't feed their lambs to the same endpoint and expect the same product. And it's critical that we remember that. Here's more of an example of a larger frame view. It's not uncommon for us to have 280 pounds of grams, whether you like it or not. We, we've got bigger. Uh, Ramblay <laughs> used at 180 pounds at UW uh, are very common use. Well, that target slaughter weight of that Suffolk Rambley cross is going to be 150 pounds, okay? Take 53% of those live weights, and that's what you're going to have as a carcass weight. The point is, is that we can't feed them all the same. You know, I, I'm probably going to wrap this up here, but very few things inspire me like this. I know it's odd. I'm clearly a sheep guy because this inspires me. But when you look, when you look at... Um, this scenario here, this comes out of one of my favorite target breeders out of eastern Montana, very moderate frame sheep. Those ewes are not more than 160 pounds, but those are two of her lambs at the end of the summer that she raised, okay? And I got the data back from her. It was about 250 pound lamb between the two of them, okay? That's how much that ewe produced. A 252 total pounds of lamb on a 160 pound ewe, that's 164% of her body. Now, granted, we've got to keep the coyotes out of them. That takes some, some aggressive management. But no other species can do what a sheep can. And I'd argue with anybody. Because that twin bearing potential, that kind of percentage of a body weight is just impressive. And, and there's still money to be made in the sheep business because of it. But if we're not focusing on total pounds of lamb wean for you, that is a very important metric for those of us not in the dairy sheep side of things, right? Well, it's still a big part of it. Well, absolutely. Like, um, that makes gold that's a crop of Yeah. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead and just show you why we want to crossbreed. When we look at the average increase we can get in crossbred lambs on various traits that we can measure, why don't we crossbreed more? I mean, I know, especially some of my best Targhee and Rambouillet breeders, I said, why don't you rotate every once in a while and buy a South African meat breeder? Or if you're a, a hardline Rambouillet breeder, Cross with the Targhee every three or four years, okay? When we can increase, my favorite, is we can increase the survival on a crossbred land over the purebred by 9.8%, why are we not crossbreeding? I, I have a pretty good market for my purebred tunis. Do you? And a registered tunis, yeah. So crossbred tunis isn't gonna bring you the same revenue. No, unfortunately, I'm not putting tunis ram on quality of news, and it has, that's been very interesting. I bet I bet they're good lambs. Yeah, they're really good lambs. Yeah. I mean, heterosis is something we've known about forever, but I think sometimes we forget that just by crossbreeding, we can increase our bottom line significantly. So this is the, the average increase in these traits in a crossbred lamb. I point out survival from birth to weaning, a 9.8% increase.
increase in survival from birth to weaning. But even look at just the, the post weaning daily gain, you get a 6.6% increase, a moderate 2.6% increase in conception rate. But when you total those up, it's almost a 30, 40% increase in total production as a result compared to the purebred <coughs> ewe. That's pretty significant. If we're in the commercial business, that's something we need to pay attention to. When you look at the heterosis from a crossbred ewe, let's say take a Targhee Ramble A crossbred ewe and put her back in the flock, even more heterosis achieved. Okay? The point is, is it pays to do that, and I, I, I consistently point this out. And the, under circumstances like you, Catherine, where you have a premium for a purebred, obviously we need purebreds to produce crossbreds, right? But for, the, for many commercial producers, why don't we maximize this more, especially in volatile markets? This is something that hits some of those, those, those risks for sure. Um, wool, I, I know people roll their eyes when we talk about wool, but I have to brag on UW's wool judging group for a minute. We, we uh, competed down at the National West this year, and we whooped up on the Texans. Now, I will tell you, <laughs> there's probably nothing as fulfilling in life than beating Texans. <laughs> I hate to say that, I love my Texas friends. <laughs> Boy, you see them lose the, our world's edging team is significant. I throw this up here, and this is based off of USDA NAS data. It takes some of our average, a nine pound fleece weight in our range state with a pretty fine wool, not pretty fine, but a, an average fine wool at 23 micron, a 54% yield. That's about, right now, it's about $6.35 clean. For us to get that, that raw price, we take uh, that nine pounds. Or I'm sorry, 6.3 clean price times 0.54, and that gives us about $3.42 a pound grease. Now, people roll their eyes when I talk about wool, but I think wool is, is experiencing a resurgence in popularity. Why? Because it's tremendous fiber, and, and good things come back in style often, and wool is one of those. But look at the gross revenue that we can get from some of our average fine wool clips here in the U.S. For us, after we pay all the costs associated with pulling that wool off, that's a $25 bill that we can get annually from our wool clip, okay? When it costs us 90 to to $100 to run the average range you in our state, if you can knock off a quarter of your costs off the bat, uh, it increases your profitability. I, I, I throw this up here because I think wool sheep, if you enjoy working with them and you have a good way to handle the wool, uh, there's no reason that we shouldn't be raising wool sheep. These are the various prices right now we're experiencing across the board. You can clearly see that our finest bull with the smallest micron right now is achieving much as it always has a premium. Um, but there's a real sweet spot in our country, and that's probably a 20 micron to a 25 micron. There's not a whole lot of change in the total revenue we get off of those micron ranges. Sometimes it's fun to just chase the best, right? And I see that a lot in our wool flocks. We just want to get finer. Let's go find it. Let's get 18 micron, right? It's worth Boy, it's worth uh, five dollars or twenty-seven dollars a head. But the reality is, is if we go too far chasing an extreme when it comes to wool, we decrease our, our our phenotypic ability for growth, and we don't necessarily pick up more pounds of lamb. Uh, we step over dimes to pick up pennies if we try and chase the finest on the spectrum. But we all have our criteria. But since we're not many of us raising, well, Catherine, you have wool. What is what are you selling an ounce for some of your hand skin stuff? So if it's been processed and turned into Roban, I can get three to five dollars an ounce. Wow. Okay. So after you've skirted and cleaned it, how many ounces do you think you're getting off of the fleece? Um on my Columbia's, I'll lose about 45%. I always pre-wash it before I send it to the processor because there's no sense in shipping dirt. Yeah. So I'll wash it, and if it's a, let's say, a 10 pound fleece, I'll have about six pounds of wool that I'm sending that's clean. And processing, I will lose maybe a pound of that. Yeah, I will always about a half a pound of processing. But I, I have it, um, I have it turned into comb top, which is a lot, a lot nicer for spinning. Yeah, yeah. But it, what did you say the price was per ounce? I can get anywhere from. Retail, I'm getting anywhere from three fifty to five dollars per ounce. Wow. Yeah. Well, case in point, that is a, a very lucrative system that you have in place. Uh, you're able to maximize your revenue based off of the fiber that you're producing. Yeah. Maybe that's an option if, for those of us in the room. Good hand spinning wool is is at a premium, and it always will be. It always will. 
and there's huge, huge interest in hand spinning um, the whole fiber thing. There will be a fiber fest in Loveland at the end of March, March 27th to 28th, okay. down at down the Embassy Suite. Then after that, there'll be another huge fiber set fest in June up at Estes Park, this Park Wall Market. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge market. Really? And and there's I mean, you can chase them all over the United States. Wow. And so there is a following. Yes. There is a huge following for good quality wool. I, I just was interviewed by Spinoff Magazine. Have you heard of Spinoff yeah, before? Yeah, the ones that are hosting. Okay. Well, I, I hadn't read their magazine before, and they said Spinoff. And anyways, I looked it up, and it, it, this is a very big, really cool <laughs> magazine. I, mean, I can't believe the, the subscription that they get to it. The point is, is there's versatility. And if there's versatility in our systems, we're more resilient to some of the changes in the commodity market, especially. So that's pretty excellent, Catherine. I'm glad you shared that. I will just end by showing you these graphs down here. We're trying to determine what, what dewormers are still working in our region. And what we found is there's a tremendous amount of resistance. Many of you probably deworm every year in the fall, maybe you do it in the spring. But what I want you to walk away with today is that based off of some of the results that we found on irrigated pastures, mind you, irrigated pastures, our benzimatazoles are no longer working, okay? So if we're using the valves in the safeguard, and we have a worm issue, we need to use something different, okay? Now that doesn't mean these don't work in non-irrigated scenarios, but irrigated pastures represent the most challenging parasitic burdens that we experience in sheep production systems, okay? Uh, and so there's various ways to manage that. The point is that these products, 83% uh, of the operations that we sampled, it was not killing any of the worms. Uh, Levamisols, again, that's a soluble uh, powder that we put in solution. We saw a slightly different story with this. It was working, but there's still resistance. Any, any product that doesn't kill or reduce the worm burden by 95% keeps 5% of the population or more in that animal, creating additional resistance. And so what we're looking for is complete susceptibility in the products that we use. And uh, Levamisol was doing it for 16%, but the other ones, it was showing low to moderate resistance, okay? Ivermectin, again, many of us, Doramectin, other uh, macrocyclic lactone products that are part of the Ivermectin family, a greater majority of those are still working. 60% of the ranches that we sampled, that was still 100% uh, effective. Other ones, again, starting to see resistance. And the only home run that we really saw was with the Moxidec, trade name being Cydex. I'm not selling any of these, and I know the manufacturers are not pleased when we say their products aren't working, but under irrigated scenarios where worms are a major burden, you need to be paying attention to what product works, because otherwise we accelerate the resistance problem. And I'm sure they've probably talked about weed resistance over this last couple of days. Have they? No? What about, sorry, yeast and dairy and bacteria are talking about, they're not worm and they're cold. Will that work? Absolutely. I think long term, this is only going to get worse for us. And if we're not selecting genetics that are resilient to those parasite burdens and have natural resistance, that's probably the long term solution. Luckily, in our area, what's been really interesting is our range flocks or even dry land grazing pastures, you don't have a worm problem because these, these organisms need moisture to survive. They travel up that dew line in the grass every morning, right? And when the sun gets out in full day, they move back down, right? They only can move by water. That's how they move. And if they get dried out, which in our range flocks happen, they don't persist. And so we've sampled, oh, six to 10 range flocks over the past year and a half, and none of them have worms. You go to an irrigated pasture scenario, uh, it's almost a guarantee that they have worms. And that's just how it is. How do you manage it? Well, it's grazing management, but it's making sure these products are working. That's kind of what what I want to get. So I have irrigated pasture mm -hmm. and I haven't warmed in six years. Really? Yes. And I'm I'm not seeing other than one Columbia U I brought in from Missouri that died from barbacole. Yeah. I have not I've not had any problems. Well Catherine, then I don't want to sample yours for part of our study. <laughs> <laughs> that those are the outliers that screw up studies. No, yeah. that's great. That's great. And I think uh, what kind of irrigation system is it? Is it a sprinkle or? It's a flood irrigation. Flood irrigation. Yeah, so there's, so you know, the water just moves mm -hmm. and dry spot, wet spot. Sheep don't like to get their feet wet. 
So they probably, well, maybe that's a scenario where you haven't brought in the worms. I, you know, I found the scenario you just described, people buy rams from the Midwest, uh, bring them back here, and they say they just don't last. Well, I'm sure it's partly climatic issues, but they all, they have a tremendous amount of internal parasite burdens in more humid climates. I think they import them to us and uh, kill those, some of those rams that we have issues with. But it's something to keep on your radar. I'm really glad to hear that, look at it, even though I was going to try and get you to participate in the study, but now I don't know how much it's doing. <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll shut up. I've gone five minutes over. Thank you. I'll stick around for uh, Blake's presentation, and then I'm going to head out back to Laramie. So.